Hi everybody, this is Noelle from Petites. We're here at Oakwood Village and we wanna talk pollinators today. A little bit more specifically, you talk about some bees and what you need to do to attract those pollinators, those efficient pollinators into your garden. And we should all really think about doing that. Um, pollinator week is later in June. June is also perennial gardening month. So we love this time of year. Uh, to be really active in the garden and bring in a lot of good pollinators. So to, to begin, two things to think about. Um, one bite out of every three bites of food is actually dependent on pollinator activity, which again, your bees are gonna be very efficient at doing that. Um, so every time you, you eat something, think about that. And then the other thing that you wanna think about is with bees and attracting bees to the, the garden, um, you know, diversity is really, really important. And um, if you can keep a little bit of color and plants that attract them throughout the growing season, spring, summer, fall, um, that's gonna be the most beneficial thing that you can do. Make sure that those plants, of course, are high in pollen, high in nectar. So I'm gonna show you some things today. Um, first of all, I wanted to mention when you're trying to attract a pollinator into the garden, you always wanna focus on three main things. The first thing, of course, is a food source. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. We have plenty of food sources at the garden center. And then also a clean source of water, which can be set up by, you know, it could be a very, very shallow bird bath or a little bit of a um, mud puddle, believe it or not, in the garden. Um, those little places, sources for clean water are awesome awesome. And then the third thing that you're always looking for when you're attracting pollinators is shelter. So shelter could just be an evergreen hedgerow, if you will, natural screening for bees. It can be a wood pile, believe it or not. Um, you know, you can set up bee houses, mason uh, bee houses and things like that too, to attract them in and invite them into a sheltered spot. So keep that in mind as well. Um, one other thing that I wanted to encourage you all is when you are trying to attract pollinators, you wanna be real responsible with your gardening practices. And that usually means limiting your pesticides. And when I mean pesticides, I mean, everything that we tend to use out there in the garden to make our gardening lives a little bit easier. But you really need to be careful when you're spraying things like herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides. Those are all considered pesticides and you really need to limit that use. Um, in fact, I'd encourage you not to use them around a pollinator garden that you're establishing that really good cultivating practices and gardening practices are gonna help you the best. Um, so make sure you're deadheading out there, make sure you're physically removing, you know, uh, bad leaves on plants or deadheading flowers that have been spent and that will really cut down on a lot of your issues that you have there. The other thing is encourage the weeds. I kid you not, um, pollinator gardens should be an area that might get a little bit rough, a little bit weedy, and that's good because weeds actually um, are a very good source of pollen and also nectar. So keep that in mind. Maybe the pollinator garden goes a little bit weedier at times, and that's actually an okay thing. Um, first thing they wanted to tell you was, we talked about diversity, so that's very, very important. All different types of plants, um, shapes, sizes, colors, great. Always a good thing to have around. The other thing, and I've mentioned this before, um, is that with, uh, especially with bees, if you have a single flower, like a, a daisy flower, where you can still see the central eye on this flower, that's a good thing. If you can see pollen directly in that plant, that's always gonna be a good thing for the bees, okay? Um, when you have a really um, doubled uh, flower, something like, I, I usually throw out a dahlia out there because dahlias can be very, very full and, and full of petals. It's usually not a great plant for uh, a pollinator. They can't get into the center. They can't get to where the nectar is and where the pollen is, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, the other thing that I wanted to tell you as far as your food source for bees um, in particular is that they really do like shallow uh, plants, something that is flat and has many, many things as far as many flowers there, um, very shallow so they can land. So those landing pads like in a daisy family, okay? 
or they will go for a plant that has like a, a small tube like encampment. If you look really close, they have these little purple tubes to them. Little tubular flowers are great or larger tubular flowers like on a penstemon. So that's always really nice too. So um, color wise, they like the whites, the yellows, the blues and violets. They usually see better in the UV range versus they can't really see the reds, okay? So that um, redder range doesn't really work for the bees, okay? Um, they do have a superpower. They actually, when they're flying around, they have um, what they call nectar guides where they can see um, where nectar is in the flower itself. So that will guide them to that type of plant, especially obviously the daisy family works really, really well for the nectar guides. Um, there are um, obviously several types of bees out there. In Northeast Ohio, you do see a lot of honeybees. Um, honeybees are, are wonderful. There are social bees. Um, they do obviously live in hives. Many, many people support them and that is absolutely wonderful. They are an excellent pollinator. Um, but there are also native bees or wild bees out there that do very, very good work pollinating. Um, things like um, your bumblebees, your sweat bees, leafcutter bees, mason bees as well. So just keep that in mind that there are many bees out there that are extremely helpful. Um, and we do want to encourage those pollinators to come into our gardens and, and again, just help pollination and help plant diversity. So that's always really good, okay? Um, I'm gonna go through some of the plant material here. And again, we're always looking for pollen, visible pollen. We're always looking for plants with a lot of nectar. Um, I mentioned the colors. They do like those light pastel colors, um, the yellows, the blues, the violets, but they also love the mint family. Um, so your mint family, an easy way to tell that it's a mint is usually it is a square stem on the uh, flower stem here. So you can feel all four sides, that square stem. So this is lavender. And again, lavender is a great, um, you know, part of the mint family. They do wonderfully as far as pollinator attracting, especially the bees, okay? Your daisies, any of the daisy family, it could be a Shasta daisy, it could be an aster. I have a pink aster here. All of them are fantastic. Um, Coreopsis right behind. Um, so there's another small daisy again. Great native. Native plants are awesome for your pollinators as well. And of course the cone flowers. Um, again, all different colors. The pinks and the whites would be great. Again, they won't see this red as much, but as it starts to develop more pollen around the cone, they would be able to detect that. So keep that in mind. The yarrow, beautiful herbal uh, plant. Again, that yellow color is fantastic for them. Penstemon is native and again has that small tubular type flower, so that's perfect. This is Russian sage in the back. And again, your sage family, if you feel that stem, it's got the square to it. So again, it's in the mint family, fantastic. Meadow sages are also excellent, so keep that in mind. Back in the back is Monarda or bee balm. Again, looks totally different from your sages or your lavender, but it has that square stem again. So great mint family relative. I have St. John's wort here. St. John's wort always has a lot of pollen around that flower, so that's a good one. We've got Agastaki with these long, long stems here. And again, in the mint family, it has that long square stem to it. And then over here on the side, your butterfly bush. And of course, butterfly bush are excellent for the butterflies, but believe me, the bees love them too. Again, just a cluster of small tubular purple flowers here. So those are excellent. One other thing that I didn't show you, and I think, you know, we, we kind of associate butterfly weed and butterfly bush with just the butterflies. They're excellent for all of your pollinators. And again, that milkweed is gonna be fantastic for the bees. So um, lots of different plant material here. The only one that I left out is hiding here. And this is a uh, sedum stone crop. And it is not blooming yet because they are very late season bloomers. But boy, the pollinator activity, especially the bee activity late season, 
is fantastic on this plant. Um, so again, grow these for maybe later season um, nectar and pollen source as well. So keep that in mind. Your fruit trees, uh, many, many shrubs, including roses, single roses, spirea, those are excellent for your pollinators. The lace cap hydrangeas, so any of those are gonna do really nicely because those small little tiny true flowers in the middle of the lace cap are really what is the most attractive to those um, bee pollinators. So again, keep that in mind. You need a good source of food. You need a water source. You do want to provide them shelter. And then you'll start to see those bees coming in and enjoy pollinator week.